Hello there. Thanks very much for watching. So our top story this hour, that news out of Iraq. Women, children, whole families among hundreds of thousands who have fled the city of Mosul after it was taken over by the Islamist militant group ISIS. The Iraqi army and police are said to have abandoned their positions after four days of violent clashes across the city. The militants are now in the nearby oil town of Beji. As you can see here, convoys of ISIS gunmen, well, they swept through Mosul on Tuesday, there they go, announcing that they had liberated the city. Now, the group is comprised of Sunni Muslims, and it poses a huge challenge to Iraq's Shia Prime Minister, Nouri al-Maliki. He's asked Parliament in Iraq to declare a state of emergency. Let's get a bit more detail about who these militants are and what they're fighting for. First of all, the name ISIS, well that stands for the Jihadist Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, abbreviated to the letters ISIS. The group's relatively young, having been formed in April 2013 as an offshoot of Al-Qaeda, but in just over a year it's already been responsible for scores of deadly attacks across Iraq and of course Syria, where they are among the most potent rebel forces opposing President Assad. What are their motivations behind the attacks? Well, they say that they are fighting for an Islamic state that would straddle the borders of both countries. And if I show you the map now, you get a picture. They do actually control swathes of territory in Syria and western Iraq at the moment. Earlier this year, the group stormed the cities of Fallujah and Ramadi, which pretty much gives them control over the huge western Anbar province. And then in Syria, they, op they, op they operate rather from the eastern edge of the city of Aleppo there, and they have a regional base in Raqqa. But our correspondent covering events in the region is Jim Muir in Beirut, and earlier he told me more about the challenges facing Iraq's government. Well, the Iraqi government has shown itself incapable of doing anything. Um, don't forget uh, that we're even talking just about a caretaker government at the moment, in theory, because Mr. Maliki uh, may have come out ahead in the May elections, but he hasn't. He has yet to form a government, so everything's sort of up in the air, and his rule is being challenged. Now, I think what's happening to a large extent, or certainly a, a quite a big extent, is the product of the fact that he has failed to bring on board the Sunni community in a way that makes it feel included in the political process and that has provided very fertile soil uh, for the extremists to move in uh, and exploit. Uh, his armed forces are clearly in a lamentable state. They're poorly officered, and the, the, the rank and file seem to be demoralized. That's why they, they broke and fled, and the police forces are even more likely to actually sympathize with the insurgents than, than with the government on, on a local basis. So all, all this, there's a big political legacy and a big legacy in the Iraqi armed forces of inadequacy and um, poor poor officership above all because the core of the army used to be the Sunni uh, officer corps. Um, all these things are not easy to fix and that's why it's going to be very hard for Mr. Maliki or anybody who wants to help him uh, to turn this situation around. That's Jim Muir in Beirut. With me on set is John Drake, an Iraq specialist for the security firm AKE Group. John, thanks for coming in. Um, let's talk about two issues here. There's the humanitarian situation of these hundreds of thousands of people fleeing Mosul and the strategic implications for Prime Minister Maliki. Um, I mean, let's focus on the strategic implications. How big a loss is this for him? This is major. This is a very large city in Iraq. And it's not only significant in terms of its economic importance, but it's also it gives access to a large area of territory that the militants will then be able to use for raising finance from the local population, smuggling weapons, smuggling fighters, conducting training and preparing, uh, using as a launch pad for attacks into other parts of the country. So because they've taken the city of, I think, two and a half million people, they now pretty much have their stamp across the area that it sits in. Um, and we, we're hearing, obviously, as well, that uh, they have moved into this oil refinery town of Beji as well. So that suggests a further advance as well. That would be another major economic loss to the government. Obviously, Ira uh, Iraq relies heavily on its hydrocarbon revenue, so that's another significant shock to the government. There doesn't seem to be any, uh, any likelihood that they're going to be able to take back significant amounts of territory anytime soon now, seeing as they face so little opposition and the military forces have withdrawn so far from the, the battleground. Now, we have been hearing today from other people who have been saying that the Iraq does have you know, quite a large army, but there are questions over its capability. What are the options now, realistically, for Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki to beat back uh, the ISIS militants? 
Well, if you look back to the height of the insurgency, the US military, the, the most powerful military in the world, struggled to contain militancy in the central region. So the Iraqi army is not as well, um, it's not as well trained, it's not as battle-hardened, it doesn't have the same resources as the US military by any comparison. So they're going to struggle regardless, but they've also lost a lot of local support because of the way that um, local residents, particularly from the Sunni community, have been treated by the government. So they, they don't have the same capabilities in the security forces, they also don't have the same local support on the ground, which is vital in terms of gathering intelligence and and having people reporting suspicious activity and, and siding with the government forces. Now we were heard, hearing earlier um, from the governor of Nineveh province, um, a regional governor there, who was saying that Nouri al-Maliki had ignored warnings about the realistic capabilities of security forces to defend Mosul. This also sort of speaks of uh, the kind of sectarian divisions between, you know, within government at different levels. Where does this leave Nouri al-Maliki's position? He is still one of the most strongest po politicians in the country, so it doesn't mean that he's immediately going to lose his ability to form a government after the election. But in terms of uh, the security situation on the ground, he, he's going to be struggling significantly. Not only has the morale of the army been very significantly devastated by this. There's also now questions being raised by local residents whether or not they can even trust these security forces. It may prompt some people, particularly armed men, to side with the Islamists because they will feel that they will be given more protection by them. So he's lost a significant amount of strategic power as a result of this. Okay. John Drake from AKE Security Group, thanks very much for coming in, John.